and we, this is our phase three detailed presentation. Just a quick note before we get started, above me is the primary screen or screen A, and to my side is screen B, which is the secondary screen. Uh, first, a quick introduction to Lufer. I am Ryan LaSalle, I'm the design team lead. Uh, here we have Kelsey Au, Macy Agello, Jonathan Johnson, Pranav Farrakhan, Keone Hill, and many in the computer we have Kay Jones. <coughs> now I will proceed to what this course entails. First we went through preliminary design. In this course we designed a supersonic business jet with respect to a request for a proposal submit that we submitted to Dr. Ashworth and he approved. He, we then did, uh, we then designed our aircraft that we've named 1-5, as seen on the primary screen, to uh, CFR and RFP requirements. And then we designed uh, this model using uh, mathematical equations from books that we would further test during detailed design using wind tunnel analysis. So for our next course, we went through detailed design where we made a 135th scale model, as seen above, where we used this model to verify our flight performance that we calculated. The, these calculations, we weren't sure on their validity because they applied assumptions. We've learned about them in classes, and we've, we understand that they should work, but we have to do verification to make sure that they do. And then once we did the, once we did the wind tunnel testing, then we did modifications to the model to make flight improvements. And then we further did more testing to test if those modifications actually improved the design. And then we did a structural analysis for the remainder of the course. Now I'll go over a overview of our presentation today. We'll cover the mission specifications and profile, the model design and construction, and then we'll go over our wind tunnel testing and then our comparison between the wind tunnel testing and our preliminary design. And then we'll go over our modifications and the second round of wind tunnel testing. And then we'll go over the effects of those modifications. And then finally, a structural analysis and conclusions. Now I'll go over the mission specifications and profile for 1.5. We were required by the request for proposal to super cruise at Mach 1.4, meaning we had to fly without afterburner at Mach 1, at sustained flight at Mach 1.4 in slough. We also had to carry eight passengers and two crew members, and we also had to take off in a 7,000 foot runway to allow us to use a large portion of the airports in this country. Then we had to use do extended twin operations in one engine and operative because we're a twin engine business jet and we have to fly, be able to fly from any west coast city to Honolulu based on our request for proposal and as we're flying this course we have to fly over water. To make sure we're safe we have to, for flight over water, we have to be have 180 minutes of ETOP certification where if we lose one engine during middle, the middle of the flight we must still be able to reach our destination with remaining fuel. We also must be cost effective for a 200 unit purchase. Then on our on the secondary screen is the mission profile, which is similar to most business jets today, except during our cruise leg after we're over water, we, we then accelerate to, super, to supersonic and cruise at Mach 1.4 to our destination. During preliminary design, the preliminary designs that we came up with to meet this request for proposal, including using uh, F-119 engines uh, that are mounted uh, on aft-mounted pylons, and we used a T-tail to get the uh, horizontal tail out of the engine exhaust. We also chose to use high aspect ratio wings with supersonic leading edges uh, to deal with our low speed performance because we have to meet the 7,000 foot runway requirements with OEI, and based on our on previous aircraft that are supersonic, such as the Concorde, who which is main problem was it had to take off at 
a very high angle of attack, and it also had problems taking off with the Boston engine, such as when it crashed in Paris in 2000. Then we uh, fitted our landing gear into the aircraft. They fold into the wing and the fuselage, and we used flaps that span the majority of the trailing edge at around 82% of the trailing edge is flapped, and we used flap runs for rolling. Then our, on the secondary screen is all of these things put together in a three view of our aircraft. This shows our length of almost 110 feet and our height of 20 feet when it's sitting on the, on the tarmac. So then in detail design, we went through and we made a 135th scale model, which we use for uh, our performance verification testing. This, this model show, is shown on the secondary screen as a three view to show the how much smaller it really is, and it's also up front here today, with uh, tufts still on it from wind tunnel testing. And now I'll pass it off to Kelsey Gow for original model design and construction. Thank you, Ryan. I'm Kelsey Gow, and I'll be discussing the original model design and construction. <coughs> To, to get our 1 and 35th scale model, five factors, as can, see, as can be seen above me on the primary screen, were considered. The first of which were the clearance of wall pads. In order to achieve this, our, our wind tunnel model was set with a span, a wind span, excuse me, of 21 inches, that it sat within a 45 inch <laughs> Blockage at the maximum angle of attack had to be considered next. Our model does meet this criteria. 4.41% blockage, which is less than 5% maximum. Cost was also a factor when making this model because later on in the course we would have to make modifications to improve this model's performance. In this first model, we have spent $450 out of our $1,000 budget. The next thing to be considered was structural limits. The wings had to be thick enough to allow for 1 8 inch steel rods to reinforce them. And lastly, the balance had a low limit of 40 pounds, which meant that our do not exceed test velocity was set at 269 feet per second. To print the model, the Stratasys, the Stratasys SST 1200ES printer was utilized. This was used to print all of our 3D or all of our ABS plastic parts. And the primary screen above me shows all of these plastic parts in an exploded view. There were five fuselage sections, the left and right wing sections, as well as two nacelles and the horizontal and vertical tail. This makes up 11 plastic parts in total. On the secondary screen, steel rods as denoted in red, were used to reinforce both the vertical tail and the wings, while, while the donated green is aluminum, which was used to both construct the pylon and, and to extend our leading edges, since the printer would not print our thin leading edges. The primary screen above me is a, is a picture of both our reinforced equinunch and our reinforced wing sections. Both of these components were reinforced with steel spars, and they were also e-glassed as to provide extra structural integrity. The primary screen here shows, shows the nose cone joint and a typical fuselage joint section. All of these plastic parts were standard before the testing to ensure that they were smooth and thus yield us the best wind tunnel results possible. And upon assembly, all of these parts and all of these parts were then epoxy for more structural strength. <coughs> Finally, the screen above me, the primary screen, shows the, all of the parts assembled together. Um, please note that the trailing edge sheet, again made out of aluminum, was inserted into the trailing into a trailing edge joint or the trailing edge slot within the, the, the trailing edge of the wing. 
and a possible piece was used to fill the gap between the, the manufactured aluminum pipeline. And the secondary screen shows the fully assembled CAD model. Before this model was allowed to um, proceed to internal testing, a structural strength application had to be performed first. Um, to do this, the model was mounted upside down on a machine beam. From there, the model was loaded in eight ounce increments until the non radiator wing bending was observed. Um, this wing bending was observed to be at about eight pounds, which yielded us a symmetric wing loading of 16 pounds. And this would mean that our resulting maximum test edge velocity would be set at 160 per second. And the secondary screen shows a picture of that test being performed. And to talk about the wind tunnel testing, I will now introduce Macy and Rachel. Thank you, Kelsey. I'm Macy, and I'll now go over the wind tunnel testing. We used a closed circuit wind tunnel uh, located in the Tracy Doryland Wind Tunnel facility here on campus. This is shown on the secondary screen. Uh, this wind tunnel has a 32 inch by 45 inch test section, and it was the largest test section that we had available. The velocity that we tested in the model at was 59 feet per second. Uh, this is different than the 160 feet per second uh, velocity that Kelsey talked about. Um, the way that we found this velocity was by putting our model at our maximum angle of attack of 20 degrees and increasing the velocity until dynamic or elastic effects were seen. And this is where we got our 59 feet per second. For data collection, we used several different devices, the first of which was a data collection code given to us by Dr. Lance Traub. Uh, this code was connected to the computer to record our data. And we also used barometer, a manometer, and a thermometer for our atmospheric conditions. Um, these data collection devices are shown on the secondary screen. Above me on the primary screen, in the top picture, um, you can see the, the mount and pivot inside the test section. The bottom picture shows the pyramidal balance that was used. And the side picture shows how our model is mounted. Uh, the balance that we used was a six-axis balance. Um, with the use of the computer code, it, um, the angle of attack was changed for our range of negative 4 degrees to positive 20, and we had to manually adjust the side slope angle from 0 to 10 degrees. Above me on the primary screen are the first three configurations that we tested. Um, the first was the complete model configuration, which tested the contribution of the entire aircraft. The second was the tail off, which tested the contribution of the tail. The third was the uh, fuselage only, which tests the contribution of the fuselage. And on the secondary screen, we have our fourth and final uh, configuration, which was our flow visualization. Uh, for the flow vis, we put uh, the white tufts, as seen on the model, um, take them onto our black um, painted model and use the black light to um, increase the contrast. Um, this led us uh, to see the local flow um, over the aircraft, or over the model, and um, to show on each component. Uh, the wind tunnel test that, that we conducted was first a tear data test, um, followed by each of the configurations uh, with the complete model, then the tail off, then the fuselage only, and finally the flow visualization, um, each for an alpha sweep and a beta sweep. I'll now go over the original wind tunnel, model, or wind tunnel test results. On the primary screen, uh, you'll see a video that shows our model changing from 8 degrees angle of attack to 10 degrees angle of attack. And with this change, we can see that the Tufts uh, reverse direction indicated a stall. The secondary screen shows a still image of uh, this test at uh, 8 degrees angle of attack and at 10 degrees uh, where the stall occurred. Um, above me on the primary screen is our lift curve. Uh, we can see that from this plot, our original, um, our original model did have a higher CL max and a higher um, CL alpha, uh, but it did have a lower, um, a lower stall angle of attack. Uh, these values are shown on the secondary screen. Next was our drag puller. Uh, our model had a higher drag than we had predicted uh, from our preliminary design. Uh, this was due to the fact that we were not able 
um, to predict the pressure drag or the pressure drag due to separation um, during our preliminary estimate. Uh, and we can see that our CD min has a value of 0.04 and uh, for our original model and a CD min for our preliminary design of 0.026 on the secondary screen. I'll now talk about the stability plots, the first of which is the pitch and moment coefficient. Uh, as you can see, our tufted model had a negative slope, which indicated stability. Um, the, it, was also, it also had a greater uh, magnitude than our preliminary design did, um, indicating that we have we are overstable in the pitch. And these values are shown on the secondary screen. And we also found our um, our trim angle of attack to be zero degrees. For our yawing moment coefficient, we can see that our tufted model did follow the same trend as our preliminary design did, uh, which had positive slope and is therefore stable. On the secondary screen. It shows that the yang moment coefficient values uh, for the preliminary design were 0 0.0042 and for the model were 0 0.0036. Uh, these close values um, show that our model did follow our preliminary design. And the last stability plot is our rolling moment coefficient, which is shown above me on the primary screen. Uh, for roll, a negative slope does indicate stability. However, our model showed for each configuration tested a positive slope. This was due to the low wing of our aircraft with no dihedral. The values for um, the rolling moment coefficient can be seen on the secondary screen. I'll now pass it off to McCray Jones to talk about our original model performance verification. Thank you very much, Macy. My name is McCray Jones. I'm going to cover the original model's performance verification. The first step in performance verification is our VN diagram or our flight envelope. On the primary screen, you're going to see that flight envelope for the uh, preliminary design and on the secondary screen for the original model. The left curved lines on each plot are stall lines, or 2.5 Gs, um, at altitudes starting at sea level and going to 50,000 feet for both VN diagrams. You can see that stall line translates um, in increasing velocity for the original model due to a lower uh, CL max. And on the right side, the vertical lines are uh, Q-bar, or dynamic pressure limits uh, for the preliminary design. It decreases down for the original model due to the increased drag on the original model. Um, and Q bar is calculated using the maximum speed at sea level and then using an equal dynamic pressure, increasing the speed as we increase in altitude due to decreasing pressure or density. Speed. With this uh, beam diagram and our thrust available, thrust required or drag, we can uh, plot our thrust plots. On the primary screen, we have for sea level and the secondary screen for 10,000 feet. The orange line is the thrust available. This is assumed to be equal for both the preliminary design and original model. The uh, green line is the original model thrust required or drag, and the blue line is the drag for the preliminary design. You can see that our maximum speed has decreased from 700 knots to around 600 knots for sea level, and again, it decreased uh, for 10,000 feet. This is, once again, due to the increased drag for pressure due to separation on the original model. You can see a similar trend of uh, maximum speed reduction at 20,000 feet. You may notice a peak in the thrust available. This is due to the design point of the F-119 being not at sea level. And at 40,000 feet, our cruise altitude, we can see we do have excess thrust at our uh, cruising velocity of 800 knots, 40,000 feet or Mach 1.4, as indicated by the violet vertical line. And at 50,000 feet, we, still, we see we still have excess thrust. So combining all the thrust, uh, required thrust available plots into one plot and divide by weight, non-dimensionalize it, we have our specific excess power, or piece of S. This is the plane's ability to change its own energy state. So for each altitude and Mach number we plan to travel at, we have plotted from 0 to 400 feet per second for preliminary design to 0 to 300 feet per second for original design, our specific excess power. A 0 feet per second does indicate that the plane is not able to increase its energy state. Thus, at this contour, at the maximum altitude, you're going to see our absolute altitude. However, the most important thing about this plot, for the original model especially, is that we can travel at our cruise velocity of Mach 1.4 and 40,000 feet altitude as we have an excess power of approximately, of approximately 300 feet per second. In summary, for the original model, we do show that our original model is uh, increased CL max from the preliminary design. Our CL alpha is increased a lot. Uh, this is due to an increased static margin from 5.6% to 62%. 
this increase in static margin will be addressed uh, by John Johnson. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Craig Hall, good morning. My name is John Johnson, and I'll be going over the modifications we made to the second round of wind tunnel testing. We made two modifications to the aircraft for the second round of wind tunnel testing. The first modification was to increase the horizontal tail uh, iron form area by 50%. Now, the goal of this modification was to increase our pitch authority during low speed flight and to counteract a, a mock tuck condition wherein the aerodynamic center shifts aftward as the aircraft goes supersonic, causing a nose down pitching moment. Having a larger tail will give us uh, a larger lift uh, force from the horizontal tail and we can counteract that. We do realize that by increasing the horizontal tail size, we will increase the static margin. Our second modification was to address the overly stable aircraft set margin. It was to decrease the wing sweep, um, decreasing the wing sweep from 27 degrees to 20 degrees at the leading edge, and that is on the secondary screen. Uh, the purpose of this was to pull the aerodynamic center forward and thereby decrease the static margin and make the aircraft less stable. This would also benefit the aircraft by producing more lift at low speeds. The two modified configurations can be seen on the primary screen. The image on the left shows the uh, new wing, the modified wing with less leading edge speed with the original tail. And the picture on the right shows the new horizontal tail, new larger horizontal tail with the original wing. Uh, these will be referred to as the new wing and new tail configurations. During the second round of wind tunnel testing, we performed a tear data test and an alpha and beta sweep for each of the new configurations. On the primary screen, you can see some images from our flow visualization test. The flow visualization showed that at 6 degrees angle of attack, the flow was still fully attached to the top surface of the main wing. At 8 degrees, we started noticing disruption in the airflow to the top of the wing, and at 10, between 8 and 10 degrees, the air, airflow reverse direction indicating stall. Now let's look at the data. The lift coefficient is plotted against the angle of attack on the primary screen. You will note that the uh, slope of the lift curve, you know, the CL alpha, is the same for both the original model and the two modified models. However, the maximum lift coefficient decreased for both of the modified models. We attribute this lower CL max to uh, changing the angle of attack in two degree increments. By changing the angle of attack in two degree increments, we had low resolution near the stall angle. One thing to note is that the angle, of, the stall angle of attack did not change between the original model and the modified models. Now, moving on to the drag polar, this is the drag coefficient plotted against the lift coefficient. You'll see that the new modified models produced less drag than the original model. That our CD min decreased from 0.029 to 0.028 for the new wing. Also, our CD cruise, which is our drag coefficient where our the coefficient is our cruise value, also decreased from 0.031 to 0.03. Moving on to the moment data, which gives us our stability, uh, you'll see the pitching moment coefficient plotted against the angle of attack on the primary screen. This is where the modifications made the most difference. The new tail, which was meant to give us better pitch authority, did in fact increase our stability by increasing the slope of the pitching moment coefficient. This slope is used as a, a factor in calculating the static margin. As you can see on the secondary screen, the new tail increased the static margin from 62% to 76% as expected. The new wing decreased the slope of the curve as expected from 62% to about 36%. We did not expect the modifications to make much difference in the yawning moment coefficient. And that can be seen on the primary screen as the slopes only uh, decrease slightly with the modified models versus the original model. This means that our yawing moment, or sorry, our yaw stability decreased slightly, but the positive slope indicates that both the original model and the new models are still stable. The original model was found to be unstable in the roll. When we modified the model, we found both modifications created a stable model. We can attribute this to two things. For the new tail, 
The tail is mounted atop the vertical tail. Sorry, the horizontal tail is mounted atop the vertical tail. So the horizontal tail acts as a winglet, increasing the effective area of the vertical tail and thereby increasing the roll stability. The new wing, by decreasing the sweep, um, as the aircraft uh, yaws, the wing that is closer to the incoming free stream, the leading edge of it is more perpendicular to the incoming free stream, increasing its lift compared to the wing that is trailing. This increases our roll stability. So what did the modifications do? First, the decrease in the wing sweep decreased our pitch stability. However, we found that this, uh, the change in the wing sweep did not change our lift or drag very much. Increasing the horizontal tail area did increase our static margin, but it also increases our pitch authority. Both modifications did decrease the yaw stability, but both are still stable and it better matches our preliminary design. And with the new modifications, the aircraft is stable in the world. Now I'll be handing it off to Pranav Tharak and from our modified model performance comparison. <coughs> Thank you, John. I'm Pranav and I'll be going over the performance comparison and modifications for our, our original model versus our modified models. First on the primary screen is um, a thrust plot at sea level and then the second screen is a thrust, thrust plot at 10,000 feet. Uh, so the green line shown is a thrust available, which is the same uh, from our preliminary design and for the original model. Next shown on the um, primary screen is a thrust plot at 20,000 feet and thrust plot at 30,000 feet on the secondary screen. Um, on these, uh, from these plots and the previous plots, it uh, can be noticed that uh, modified models have a um, similar drag and it's slightly higher than the original model drag. Next on the primary screen is uh, thrust plots at 40,000 feet, which is a cruising altitude. Uh, indicated, by the, indicated by the vertical red dash line is our cruising velocity, which is Mach 1.4. Um, at this region, we have an excess uh, thrust available, as can be seen from the plot, uh, which indicates we can fly and achieve Mach 1.4. Uh, on the secondary screen is thrust plots at 50,000 feet. Uh, this shows we have regions of uh, um, of, of excess thrust, which uh, tells us that we can fly at 50,000 feet. Next shown on the primary screen is a weird dynamic comparison between the original model and the modified models. Since our original models of both new wing and new tail configurations had the same CL max and extremely similar um, drag data, the weird, their weird diagrams overlap each other and as such is depicted as the modified model and the weird diagram comparison. Um, it can be seen that the stall lines and the keel movement have decreased for the modified models as the CL max of the modified models was lower than the original model and the drag for the modified models was higher than the original model. <coughs> Next show on the primary screen is a specific excess power plot comparison between our modified models and the original model. It shows that we have a small reduction of uh, specific excess power for the modified models as uh, the, drag for the, the drag for the modified models was higher than uh, the original model. Next, I'll be passing it off to Keone Hill to talk about the structural layer and analysis. Thank you, Pranav. As you said, my name is Keone Hill, and I'll be going over the structural layer and analysis. First shown on the primary screen is the structural VN diagram of 1.5. This VN diagram was constructed at sea level, which includes ghost lines constructed from CFR 25 regulation. Uh, from this plot, we have a maximum load factor of 3.8 Gs. Illustrated on the primary screen is the wing structure of 1.5. This design is based on the four authors listed on the secondary screen, which results in a Front spar location at 20% cord, rear spar location at 67% cord, and a rib spacing of 18 and 24 inches. Illustrated on the secondary screen are the materials used within the wing structure, with green representing the aluminum alloys uh, 2024 T3 for the skin, and 7075 T6 for the spars, ribs, and skin. While black represents the titanium alloy of 6AL4B, which composes the leading edge and control surfaces. <coughs> The 
illustration on the primary screen shows the flaps deflected. It was determined that a deflection of 7 degrees of flaps was required for takeoff, while 20 degrees flap deflection was required for landing. A dimension drawing of the wing plus the flaps and ailerons are shown on the primary screen. The flaps occupy 82% of the span and 30% of the cord, while the aileron occupy 30% of the cord and 30% of the span. Primary screen shows an illustration of the Oppenheim structure, which is based on the two offerings listed on the secondary screen, which results in a front spar location at 25% cord, rear spar location at 67% cord, and rib spacing is of 18 and 24 inches. Similarly, on the secondary screen, the materials are illustrated. Uh, green represents the aluminum alloys, which compose the skin, spars, and ribs, while the black represents the titanium alloy Closing the leading edge and control surfaces. Shown on the primary screen is the uh, vertical tail between the rudder and an all moving horizontal tail. The horizontal tail is all moving, which is also called a stabilator, while the vertical tail includes a rudder which occupies 30% of the cord and 100% of the span. Next, shown on the primary screen is the uh, structure of the engine pylon. This pylon was designed with three spars at 25, 50, and 70% cord, with rib spacings of 18 inches. This supports the engine weight thrust and also the uh, fuel lines, hydraulics, and electronics. Next to on the primary screen is the structure of the fuselage. This is based on Rossman Common News recommendation, which results in a frame, a frame depth of 3 inches, frame spacing of 24 inches, and a log ground spacing of 12 inches. Shown on the primary screen is an isometric view of the fuselage structure. Shown on the secondary screen is an illustration of the materials used, with green again representing the aluminum alloys for the skin and frames, while black representing the titanium alloy for the nose skin, and cockpit structure to compose the bead glass. It was determined through weight and balance that 1.5 requires 28,600 pounds of fuel in order to uh, meet our range requirements. This was then converted to 570 feet cubed, which is represented by the red and the primary screen. 1.5 incorporates the Honeywell RE220 APU with a weight of 238 pounds, which is represented by blue on the primary screen. Shown on the primary screen are the flaps deflected, or I mean, shown on the primary screen are the landing gear being retracted into the fuselage. The secondary screen shows that the nose gear retracts forward into the fuselage while the main gear retracts inward into the fuselage while also pivoting forward. <coughs> the landing gear pivots forward due to the fuselage tapering upwards towards the back. Uh, on the primary screen shows the front view and side view of the landing gear fully retracted, while the secondary screen shows the top view of the landing gear retracted. Uh, shown on both slides are the overall structure of 1.5. Now we're going over the structural loading and finite element analysis of 1.5. Shown on the primary screen are the wing loading results. You can you see on the left figure that the wing loading is distributed only along the front spar, which is located at 25% cord, while the figure on the right of the primary screen shows that the wing loading is then distributed between the front and rear spar due to the aerodynamic shift rearward during supersonic flight. The rear spar is located at 67% cord. Next shown is the deflection results of the wing for subsonic and supersonic loading. Primary screen shows the subsonic loading, which results in a deflection of 14 inches, tested at a load factor of the maximum load factor of 3.74. This exhibited an after twist, while for subsonic for supersonic loading, the this is a forward twist and a maximum of 15 inches. Similarly tested was a horizontal tail, which resulted in a 1.7 inch deflection and similar, similar AF twist for subsonic loading. Secondary screen shows the supersonic loading with a 1.9 inch deflection and a similar forward twist for supersonic loading. The vertical tail is also uh, Tested in axis with a def maximum deflection of 0.092 inches uh, for subsonic loading and 
0.16 inches for supersonic load. And now I'd like to hand it off to Ryan Lazar for cost analysis. <coughs> Thank you, Fiona. I'm Ryan Lasalle. I'll go over the cost analysis. Uh, one five uh, was its cost was estimated using the RAND approach. This gave a 139.6 million dollar purchase price for each airplane, but we also looked at the RAND purchase cost uh, of similar aircraft, similar to us, including the Concorde and the Gulfstream G280. Uh, these aircraft, we looked at their uh, purchase price today, and we compared it to the RAND purchase price as in today's dollars, and noticed that the RAND method severely overestimated the cost. So we used uh, a percentage to decrease the expected cost of one of our aircraft down to $63 million per aircraft. Now I'll go over our design project plan. Uh, for, first, we have our Gantt chart. This is our final phase of detail. This shows our key milestones as well as today's presentation. Uh, now I'll go over labor and cost accounting. Uh, first off, we for our predicted hours during the above me on the primary screen, as you can see at the beginning of the semester. We were below hours, and then during the middle of the semester, we picked up and were above hours. And then during this last phase, we have slowly uh, converged to the predicted hours line, the estimated hour line in blue. And then uh, on the secondary screen, we see our percentages of what we use most of our time on. In this case, we use most of our time on the in engineering uh, management as well as the engineering time. This is mainly because of how many meetings we had and how uh, much engineering we had to do. Uh, then these are our costs for uh, a typical week for our team. This shows uh, we spent uh, a majority of our time doing professional development in class for our cost was mostly learning. And then our second cost was engineering on a weekly basis. Now I'll go over our conclusions and our recommendations. Uh, first off, the model is unstable in role. So we recommend that for the first flight test article or for a, another round of wind tunnel testing that we add dihedral to the aircraft. Uh, just a small amount to make sure it's stable. Even though it is stable with the new, or in the, with the new horizontal tail configuration and the new wind configuration, we would rather uh, make sure it is more stable, just to make sure it is stable enough for a commercial pilot. Then we also notice that our static margin is larger than necessary and much larger, well, much larger than our preliminary estimates. To fix this, we recommend using a trim tank for the first flight test article, because this is a much easier method of shifting our center of gravity, and it also allows us to correct for our center, our aerodynamic center shifting during supersonic flight. We also uh, noted that our trim angle of attack is around zero from our CM alpha plots, which is a good thing, and shows that we can, in fact, fly supersonically because we don't have too much trim rate. Then we also need to fully optimize our structures for a, the first flight test article, as our structures right now use too much metal and would cost more than would be required to make this aircraft, and it would also cost more fuel because there's more weight. So then we also recommend that we proceed to the initial flight test with a flight test article that uses the larger horizontal tail, a trim tank uh, behind the fuel tank. We do not recommend the use of the new wing because we need the, the critical Mach number that the 27 degree wing sweep provides over the 20 degree wing sweep. And the subsonic performance was not increased by a, it was, the lift was not shown to increase for the uh, wind tunnel test case for this. 
And then we also recommend to use, and we use the original link because of this. Any questions? And thank you for your time. Okay, so I'm just kind of confused why you need 
represent a, a point load there, basically, and then yeah, in your, your ANSYS model, you've got uh, all the different uh, cells there in the very part. It's just kind of an odd combination of things. So I think I understand what you're saying. Just yeah, just core wise is, is on that whole front spot that I, the view is confusing, I understand. Okay. Um, Uh, on slide 37, you don't need to bring it up, but you, you showed the specific next of power pots, which I think is good. You showed that hey, you can still reach your, your supersonic cruise point at the altitude you're going for. Uh, something that I think would be uh, really useful to put on there is your climb profile. Try and, and say, how am I going to get there? Because in a plane like this, that's going to significantly impact your operations. You know, you're what speed, what altitude, where do I need to be on that plot to get where I want to go most efficiently. So, good job, guys. I thought that seemed to work. I'm going to start with one of my favorite questions over here. Walk me through the tear testing of the tunnel and the gate direction to work by. I'll let my uh, test plan team lead take this question. said early on in the test methodology section that there was a tear data test it was on slide 24. Tell me, explain that tear data test to me and then walk me through the rest of the data correction procedure once the tunnel data was acquired. I'm actually going to pass the train because I was not present for the tear data test. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for the test, first we took the model up and we put it on the balance and we first found what our maximum test velocity was of 59 feet per second. Then we took the model off the balance, we took it out of the tunnel, and then we put the mount at zero degrees angle of attack, and then we ran the tunnel up to our test section velocity of 59 feet per second, and then we used the computer program to take our tear data which is just the all of the six, the three axes and the uh, moments about those axes data for those points, which gave us the coefficients in each of those or the forces in those directions, as well as the the computer program converted them to coefficient of lift data, coefficient drag, which all could be subtracted off of our data once we got that data from the. In the in the next tests. Okay, it, that's relatively appropriate for a tear. You missed the interference piece of that, but then what additional data correction were applied, if any? None were. No additional corrections were applied. That's usually the answer. I get. It's, it's unfortunately that's not the right answer, but it's what we can figure out of that. Um, there are a whole host of data corrections that can just be applied to your test data. Wall corrections, uh, flow angularity, um, uh, model similarity, blockage, things of the nature. Uh, it's one of my favorite subjects to harp on every year. And I can, you guys definitely are the first one, you won't be the last ones. Um, just keep that in mind if you get into a test realm, there are a lot of additional processing that will typically need to take place prior to having usable information um, that's applicable to what you're attempting to do. So, next question. Walk me through the data correction process that said that your drag calculations were applicable from a low speed tunnel to a supersonic jet, trying to estimate cruise inversion. Thrust required plus available plots and 
Did you did you have a way there to put it in your drag build up? Yes. Okay. That's, that's good. That's all good. Thanks, good work. Um, first of all, nice job. It's like a lot of hard work this semester. And um, let's see, can you go to slide 43? Um, looks like, and I could be wrong because so it's kind of hard to see, but it looks like you've got stall on one side, and it's maybe um, halfway between the, the root and the tip, maybe even out towards the tip. Do you have any concerns about uh, tip stall with this configuration or asymmetric stall? And uh, or can you explain maybe what's going on in those, those pictures? Um, we expect, because it is a swept wind, that the and it's an afterward swept wind, that the tip is going to stall first. Uh, as such, during our uh, evaluation of our landing and our takeoff abilities, we applied we ex expected that we'd only use 80% of our available lift curve to, for the pilot to take off and land. So that they couldn't, and we would make sure that they could never go towards the stall in the first place because our wing has a sharp and sharp leading and trailing edge. And we expect the, and from the moment coefficient plus, we noticed that it goes unstable during the stall regime anyways because uh, of the sharp leading and trailing edges, so we'll pitch nose up. So it would be a really bad condition for a pilot to get himself into to stall this aircraft. So, uh, and on top of that, uh, for the rest of your question, for analyzing the flow visualization, I'll hand it off to Macy who did the rest of our focus. Um, so for, for the flow vis, um, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the old wing and the new wing. Um, and they did both stall between eight and 10 degrees. Um, and I guess, can you like, repeat what you want to Well, I guess if you're coming in for a landing uh, and you've got a, a potential to tip stall, which is bad in general, especially if you're close to the ground, um, maybe, I think what I think I'm seeing and what you explained to me is that the, the stall occurs out more towards the tips. So maybe um, I should go to the next question, and that is, how would you mitigate that in, in your design um, before you went to flight test? How would you handle it? Because the tip stall in general is a bad thing. Well, uh, John, I'm catching you guys off guard. It sounds no, like so. um, I think John can answer this question. I have an idea. Um, but <laughs> So, um, as far as the tip stall, yes, that would be a very bad condition. Um, one of the ways we could uh, increase our controllability in that case would be to add fences or like a dog tooth on the wing that would increase the uh, cause the vortex over, over the air. So the flow is more energized and more stays attached longer, and that would help delay losing control. Um, uh, it sounds like with maybe with this condition as well as uh, some of the other like, roll stability and um, uh, in order to be able to handle your, uh, your static margin issues, it sounds like you could use, uh, oh, not to mention the fact that you're transitioning between subsonic, transonic, and supersonic. Sounds like one an, an additional solution could be a, either stability augmentation system that's scheduled with Mach number, or a digital flight control system in order to be able to handle um, the wide range of flight conditions that you're offering. So something to think about there. Um, I think uh, that you guys went through a, a, an iterative process and then ended up going with the uh, original wing and, and I appreciate the logic that you shared with us as to why you did that. I think that was the right choice because uh, you're going to spend more time um, and most of your fuel at the cruise condition than you are at takeoff and landing. So nice job there. Uh, I had a question on your selection of material for control surfaces. Why did you pick titanium? Uh, Kim?
chose uh, that alloy for its high strength. Um, it's also using the leading edge for the high temperature during superstar flight. And, uh, I understand the leading edge part, but why titanium on the, on the control surfaces? Typically, I don't see as much heat as the, uh, the leading edge, and it's more expensive, a bit more difficult to work with. I mostly use totally for the strength and how much force it's going to have for a deflection at high speeds and, and all different things. Uh, I can better answer that question. Uh, it was chosen because it's the uh, those surfaces are extremely thin. Uh, since we have a triple O six airfoil, the the train the control surfaces our our wing at its maximum point is around uh, one foot thick on the full scale aircraft. So when we're back at seventy percent core, these are extremely thin uh, control surfaces, and we need the higher strength than aluminum. Okay. And did you compare other materials like composite or? Do a trade study on, on material selection? We didn't do a full trade study on that portion of the of the material selection. We selected the titanium based on, uh, we also chose it because we were already using it for the leading edge, so we expected that it would be uh, a little cheaper if we were to use the same material for multiple parts than to switch materials repeatedly. Well, I would challenge you as you go off to industry and future jobs that, so it, it sounds like you made an assumption there, um, and in the short amount of time, I can see why you would do that. But um, as, you, as you head off into your careers, uh, I, I would uh, challenge you to make uh, some trade studies in, in, in these areas so that you can um, have a well justified answer um, on your, in your future endeavors. So, overall, nice job. Thank you. Anyone else? Were there any, was there a, uh, anyone do a weight balance calculation in all this? Yeah. Okay. Because I don't, I, maybe I missed it, but I don't think I heard an overall weight of the aircraft. Okay. Um, don't take off weight if you have that. Yeah.